Dr. Richard Carrier, I have another Patreon member named Nick who has a question for you. Thanks, Nick, for supporting me, man, and making this possible. Hello. I have a question for Richard Carrier. He has a great chapter, The Spiritual Body of Christ, in the book The Empty Tomb. However, that chapter, it seems to me, makes sense only if Jesus was historical. As he writes, if the, if the Corinthians believed that Jesus' physical body was still in the tomb. Can you please explain, or ask him to explain, if and how that chapter makes sense if, Jesus, if the Jesus myth theory is true? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I actually, in, in that chapter he's talking about, this is a book called The Empty Tomb that was edited by Jeff Lauder and Robert Price. It has a lot of great chapters in it. it. has three chapters by me. One is The Spiritual Body of Christ and The Legend of the Empty Tomb. Uh, and the other is the theft. I have a chapter on the theft theory, and I have a chapter on the, st uh, the missing body, the misplaced body theory. Now, all these chapters, people often say, like, well, those chapters contradict each other. And it's like, yeah, I'm not saying any one of these is necessarily true. I'm just saying that we can show any one of them is true, right? Like, they, they, they all have plausible case made for them. So, therefore, you can't argue for the genuine resurrection of Jesus when there's all these other ways the evidence could have come about. And so what I do is I give, here's the best case for the theft scenario, and it fits all the evidence and fits it better than the supernatural hypothesis. And I go, well, let's suppose you don't believe in the theft scenario. What if the body was misplaced? Well, here's all the evidence that would support that. And I show that that's also consistent with the evidence. Um, and then I had the other much, much longer chapter, which is the one at the time that I thought was more, the more probable uh, of them. Uh, which is uh, the idea that, well, there wasn't even an empty tomb. They, they came to believe Jesus was risen from the dead by revelation only. And this is clear in Paul. Like these, the only evidence that Jesus is risen from the dead that he cites, other than scripture tells us he did, uh, is the visions that we, he appeared, right? And so they, they have these, I saw Christ too, and he appeared in me and, and told me all this. Um, so I think that fits the evidence best. And so the question is, uh, how, could the, how could they have been convinced uh, that Jesus had risen from the dead by revelation when there would still be a body around, right? Uh, now, there's actually multiple responses to that argument, and, and among them, the fact that there wouldn't have been at that time any way to tell the difference between the genuine body of Jesus or not. Uh, so they could, if even if someone could point to a body in a grave, they would just say, oh, that's just, you're just conning us, that's just some other body, right? You're, you're try, trying to pull a trick. Um, so it would be easy to deny that evidence. It wouldn't have any effect on their mission. But there's another way to explain it, which looks like the way that it, that was being uh, argued at the time, which was, uh, well, that body doesn't matter. That's that's a sh that's the garbage shell that he just discarded. <clears throat> he, he he rose in a new supernatural body, a superior body. He jumped from one body to the other, and that was therefore demonstrated that so the same will happen to us, right? It's the idea that we're going to throw away these garbage bodies, but we're going to get new, better bodies. Trust it; it's going to be great. And in that chapter, I show that this is not a novel idea. There are other Jewish sects that were selling pretty much the same concept, that the body of flesh is garbage, so we got to get rid of it. It wouldn't be, it would be contrary to the mission of afterlife belief to have, to be risen in this, this crappy, you know, uh, uh, sinful body or whatever. Uh, but if you can jump from that, leave the old one behind and jump into a new superior body, well, that explains everything. So there were some Jews who actually were making this argument already. So this is, this is not a novel concept. So the question is, in that chapter, I do have one line where I mentioned this theory could also be made compatible with a non-existent Jesus. Uh, and at, because at the time I was aware of Doherty's theory, but I was not yet convinced of it. Uh, so in that chapter, I argue from the assumption of historicity. So that whole chapter was written based on the assumption that there was a historical Jesus. And therefore, how could all of this have happened? And that's what I argue in the chapter. Uh, now, years later, you know, in 2008, so that was 2005, right? So in 2008... Uh, that's when my um, when my fans uh, basically got a research grant together for me to do a postdoc study on historicity, and it was only after I completed that study. I mean, I'm, I was convinced by about halfway through, but by the end of it, for sure. So between 2008 and 2014, that six-year period, that's when I really started to become a mythicist, started to realize the evidence for historicity doesn't hold up. So my mythicism was really, a, a, you know, I was convinced of it after I wrote the 2005 chapter. But... There's a lot of material in the 2005 chapter that was actually contributing to my realizing it, the plausibility of mythicism, realizing that Doherty's theory works. And this is because this is what Doherty's theory was, and it's the theory that I actually advocate uh, under peer review in the book, which is that they did believe that he that Jesus assumed a body of flesh, uh, and that that body was died or was killed, and that that body was buried. These were they thought these were historical events that actually happened. 
but they thought they happened in some other mythical realm, uh, the cosmic realm. Uh, I argue for the most evidence is the one that Doherty presents, which is of a firmament, some sort of celestial event, because there's tons of evidence that Satan and his demons lived up there, and they had castles and gardens and all kinds of things up in the sky thousands of miles away. Uh, and that was actually the usual location of Satan and his demons. And so the, the theory is that, that Jesus came down to that level, convinced the, the, the demons and stuff that he was a man, like a, you know, a sorcerer or something had flown up there or whatever. And so they kill him, uh, you know, mockingly or whatever, not realizing that this is going to realize Jesus's mission and allow him to defeat them and overcome their power over death and so on. Uh, and then he gets resurrected. Now in that theory, there is a body of Jesus and it's sitting up there somewhere. It's buried in a garden in Satan's you know, back lot or something, right? Uh, so there actually is a body uh, that, that was a discarded shell uh, that was left behind. E even in the mythicist theory, even in the Doherty model, uh, that would be the case. And it would be similar to the fact that they're up in outer space are the bodies, also the buried bodies of Adam and Eve. Uh, we have this from pre-Christian uh, Jewish literature, the, the life of Adam and Eve, where they talk about Adam and Eve, when they are kicked out of paradise, they are literally... It's a literal fall. They fall from the third heaven down to earth and scratch out an existence down on earth. And then when they die, angels come down and take the corpse, first of Adam, later of Eve. But first of Adam, they take the corpse back up to bury him in the original paradise, the original third heaven, uh, the original Eden. And so his body is buried up there, waiting for the resurrection, the general resurrection at the end of time. And... Um, so already in Jewish belief, there's this idea that there were burials, there were buried bodies up in outer space. So that was that was already a standard thing that they believed in and had no trouble believing in. Uh, so it would so the Doherty thesis actually fits context. Uh, there's not really anything to argue against it. So that's why the question becomes simply not whether they believed Jesus uh, took on a mortal body, even a Jewish body, even a Davidic body, and then was killed and then was buried, and then physically rose in a in a new superior body. The question is only, where did they think that happened? Uh, that's the only question that we need to answer with regard to Paul when we're reading the letters of Paul. Is he talking about events that, that they believed occurred on earth? Or is he talking about events that he believed occurred somewhere else? Uh, and it's even possible, I mentioned in a footnote in On the Historicity of Jesus, that the somewhere else could even be on earth. It could be like the lost paradise, some location on earth that just wasn't witnessed by humans. And so you could still only learn of it by revelation. That's a possibility. I think the evidence more strongly supports the celestial hypothesis. Um, and anyway, all of this evidence and all of it is discussed in On the Historicity of Jesus as to why this is the most plausible outcome. So on that scenario, yes, they, they, the, the um, spiritual body of Christ chapter completely fits because it's the same thinking. Yeah, the, the discarded shell of Jesus, yeah, is sitting up in Satan's garden or whatever. Uh, but that's not Jesus. Jesus jumped into a new body and he ascended and he's now is Lord from uh, the higher heavens, right? So that's... That's how that actually would work in, in, in completion there. Um, so yeah, it's definitely compatible uh, with the mythicist hypothesis. Would you agree, and I, I love this, uh, what you're asking here, because these are questions I've asked. You know, is it possible that mythicism would work and yet he comes to earth instead of dying up in heaven? Because right. mm -hmm. it's really weird because the literature we and the people watching this are most commonly familiar with are not the literature you're talking about, the, the life of Adam and Eve. Like, you, yeah, <laughs> you lose most people, right? When they're like not aware of celestial gardens. That's and right. All that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's like, no, we have this canon, and why aren't we? This is the point I make in the first chapter of Jesus from Outer Space: is that you have to understand these this literature in its actual context. So you have to read it the way that people reading it then would understand it. You have to know the things they know or believe or think. And I think there's a lot of anachronism. People are looking at the Gospels, imagining that the people at that time thought the same things about the cosmos and the world that we do, and they did not. They had radically different worldviews uh, of, of how things were. Or worked. even literature-wise. Like we literature -wise, anachronistically yeah. assume, and I know this is going to sound funny, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. We assume Paul knows Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Revelation. Like we That's assume... a good example of, uh, of an even stronger anachronism, right? It's exactly his, because the Bibles are all published with his letters after the Gospels. Right. Everybody just assumes that Matt, Paul is writing with knowledge of them. When you when you get rid of that assumption, you start to realize it's not even possible. It's obvious he doesn't have any idea about the contents of those gospels. So the, clearly they were, came up later. Uh, but that's but even with regard to like cosmic beliefs, and one of the examples is today the the mainstream pretty much everywhere view is that heaven is not a place up there that you can point to. You can't send a rocket to it, right? It's some sort of alternate dimension, right? It's yeah. some sort of other universe. It's not even physically connected with ours. 
Um, but that's, that's because we discovered that there's not. Well, any yes, because that's out the there. thing is that having <laughs> heaven actually having the dead live actually on the moon is problematic now because we've been there and we know they're not there, so you can't really maintain this belief anymore. <laughs> um, so we've changed that. But that's so people are reading the text. They think when they're talking about heaven, they think they're talking about heaven like we mean today, this other dimensional place. That concept did not exist at all in antiquity. There was no idea of this alternate dimension. Uh, everything was physically accessible. Everything was part of the complete coherent cosmos. So they thought heaven was literally up there. And in fact, it had many layers. There was the firmament was the lowest part, which was the most corrupted heaven. Uh, is the, you know, the sub, sub heaven, the sublunar heaven. And the moon is kind of part of that, right? So the moon is kind of orbits it and kind of creates the boundary. Uh, and some even thought like there was like a crystal ball and that there were like locked gates so that that's how, what Satan and his angels couldn't get back up because there were these locked gates and you had to have the right password to get past the angel guarding the gate for each level and it would go up. And so you'd have the first heaven is the range between the moon and to, to the next planet, right? And then, <clears throat> you know, each so planet, you, yeah. Yeah, you got Mars, Venus, the sun is one of them, right? So, so you, all the way up to the seventh heaven, which is this field of the stars and that's where God's throne is and that's where this... And, the other thing they believed, and you, again, I show all the evidence and put it in the book and from primary sources and everything, is that everything on Earth had copies in the heavens. So, like, everything on Earth is the most corrupted version of everything. So, for, if there's gardens on Earth, there's gardens in the firmament. If there's gardens there, there's gardens in the first heaven, which are even more perfect. And the gardens in the second heaven were even more perfect. And the most perfect, absolutely perfect gardens are the gardens in the seventh heaven. And they are the fundamental model <clears throat> that all the others are emana poorer emanations of all going all the way down. Isn't this where Paul is his celestial body concepts coming from that you're going to have the most seventh heaven. Correct. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't spe specify seventh. Heaven right. He this. just is talking about, but he does say, yeah, the everything stuff. below the moon, he doesn't say moon, but he says of this world of the earth, but he's talking about earth and its atmosphere and to them. That was everything to the moon. Uh, they hadn't, there, there were some scientists who knew the atmosphere ended long before the moon. Uh, but the general belief was the atmosphere went all the way to the moon but that it was 100,000 miles or more. They were aware of the distance that was vast. So this isn't like a little, like a like Satan's living really close in the sky. He's literally thousands of miles away. That's why you can't see him, right? So um, so that's their, their this is, but this is, these are their beliefs. They actually, this is how people believed and understood the world was organized. So you have to understand that in order to understand what these texts mean and what these people are saying. So when Paul says he knows someone who went to the third heaven, and visited Eden. He says they visited paradise in the third heaven, which is a direct reference to the life of Adam and Eve. So he's fully aware of the fact that Adam's body is buried up there. He knows this text and so on. Uh, and he says there are secret things were communicated there that he can't he can't repeat in the letter, right? So um, some scholars think he's referring to himself, that that's mm -hmm. Paul did that. Uh, I'm not sure of that, but it doesn't matter. He genuinely, and his other Christians that he's writing to, genuinely believe someone genuinely went to the third heaven in some fashion which is the Adam and Eve, which would be Eden. in in most heliocentric or no, in most geocentric schemes would be the sphere of the sun. Okay. So it would be the sphere. It would be the sphere either of the sun or I think of Venus. I can't remember which, but there are different schemes, right? So, but usually it would be the sun. So that would be the the realm where the sun orbited is the role where paradise is, um, and which ironically is where the Normans think that there's secret cities inside the sun, right? That's, anyway, uh, that would have been totally, they would have said, oh yeah, of course there's cities inside the sun. That's, that's the third heaven. Where else would it be? Yeah. Um, but uh, so anyway, Paul says that, that there are people that there, he knows someone and all the Christians know that someone has gone to the third heaven and heard secret things told them there in, in paradise in the third heaven. Very important to mention. This is just normal. This is the, like how they believe the world is organized. And so you can't understand what they're talking about if you don't see it from their point of view. You've got to get rid of all the anachronistic assumptions like this heaven of an, as another dimension. That's not how they understood the world. It would have been unintelligible to them at the time. So th that's just one example. There are many other examples of things that people take for granted in this time uh, that you have to understand are different from the way we assume things today. And, and another example is the idea that well, a, a hero or a messiah should be like, should never have any struggles and should never be defeated or anything like that. He should always be perfect. But th that's actually, there's actually no example of that in any literature in antiquity, neither Jewish nor, uh, nor pagan. The idea that heroes had to go through struggles and suffering uh, and have a downside and then recover from was the norm. Like that was how you understood heroes. You, you couldn't understand a hero that never, never had any trouble and never had any struggles, never had a passion. So, so that when you understand that, the mindset, like, of course, Jesus is going to have 
his own passion, this this mythic hero is going because that's what all mythic heroes did back then. You you wouldn't have a mythic hero if it wasn't in a model like that. So that's just another example. But there's a lot of ways that you come at this. You have to see the world from the way they saw it, mm -hmm. uh, and then you understand that these texts mean different things than we've been assuming because our assumptions are based on our modern ideas that, that they're not existent when these texts were written. So the final question I have in this, and this is something I think. I'm sure you'll share my struggle in terms of when you think about mythicism. Yeah. When the Gospels come up, this is the thing. You know how I already mentioned we don't have, you know, we're, we're packaged to read Matthew to Revelation. Right. We aren't packaged to read Life of Adam and Eve, all of this other background information Book that of is Enoch absolutely is really necessary yeah. in order to get the mindset of someone like Paul or even to have an idea maybe what Paul yeah. thought. But do you feel, and, and I'd love to hear your struggle with this, how much of a pain in the ass it is trying to promote or even say, look, mythicism seems to be the most plausible because the Gospels already, they paint this picture. And so you have scholars like Delcy Allison, for example, he said on, on air, I asked him, Paul's vision of the resurrected Christ, resurrected Jesus. Do you think that Paul thought Jesus bodily rose as in like physically, or do you think this is some like what Jim Tabor, when I interviewed him, he says, look, this is a spiritual body. It's not complete flesh and blood. No, he says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm. but it's another type of body, whatever it might be. It might glow. It it's might have light. It's important to make that distinction that it's a bodily resurrection either way. But I think the distinction is flesh. Is the flesh or is it a new body? Is the flesh left behind? That's the question you need so to ask. So this yeah. is the thing Delcy Allison said. And you'll see what I'm saying about this whole mm -hmm. gospel's sticks this wrench in mythicism in a way, and it doesn't mean it disproves it. What I mean is it causes hindering for people sure. to understand yeah. what mythicism mm -hmm. and how this makes sense, is that Del Allison said, well, I think Paul's vision of a resurrection, he says he was buried. It's not that far off to say if he was buried, Mark says he was buried, and then he rose from a tomb. So like he has mm -hmm. this continuity concept as most Christians see a continuity yeah. and disconnecting Paul from gospel ideas right. is so complex to go, okay, look, you got a Pontius Pilate narrative here. He's killed and crucified by Pontius Pilate. What are you doing? Is Pontius Pilate in the first heaven right, here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like where and that is the hard part. That's for people. why it's so essential to understand the mythographic style of the way the gospels are composed. Which also requires context again, the understanding context, you got to look at if you really want to understand what it means to have a mythic hero historicized you should read the stories of all the mythic heroes historicized. So we have a life of Romulus by Plutarch. It looks exactly like the biography of real people. He has a biography of Caesar. It looks exactly the same, right? Um, it, you know, it's very similar in the construction, the way they would tell these stories. And so you would ask, like, why would they make up all this historical stuff about Romulus? Why would they write about it like it's a historical biography when he never existed? Uh, you have to you have to understand the mindset of what they're doing here. What is what is going on here? What what is the purpose of this life and the biography of it? Uh, and why are they ca why are they packaging packaging it that way? Um, and it, th and the fact that this was common. Uh, you pick any non-existent hero who is historicized. There are about bi bi there are gospels of them, right? So you like Plutarch talks about the lives that were written of Osiris, and the, and, and he, he quotes and actually cites the the things that happened, events in his life, and struggles he went through and stuff like that while at the same time plutarch says yes but all of that's uh front allegory it's all symbolism meant to to pre prevent outsiders from understanding the truth the truth is that osiris was actually killed by the equivalent of satan in the outer space below the moon just it's basically the exact same model that i think doherty is right about for jesus i think they borrow the same idea osiris is actually descends becomes incarnate in a body of flesh and is killed by set uh, uh up up in the heavens and then resurrects becomes triumphant and ascends again and you only know this uh spiritually you can't no one was there to go witness it because it didn't happen down here mm -hmm. uh, and then but yet they go around telling the story of the death and resurrection of osiris as an earthly event as a pharaoh who gets killed by uh you know an enemy and stuff like that uh that's normal that's the thing is that you gotta understand that's actually the ordinary way that's going on and people are writing about mythic heroes in this time so when when you look at like Marx doing the same thing, he's doing the same thing Plutarch did with Romulus. He's doing the same thing that the Egyptian priests did with the story of Osiris. Pick anybody, they're doing the same thing. And then, of course, that becomes more obvious. So that's the context. So the context already tells you that, okay, it's already possible that Marx doing the same stuff. Now the evidence, you go and look at the evidence and you can confirm that this is what Marx is doing because 
you go through it and you analyze story from story to story and the structure of the stories. And this is where I go into in chapter 10 and on the historicity of Jesus. You see that Mark is literally crafting the entire thing as a parable. He wants, it's the message, not the literal events that matter. For him, it's, you're supposed to get the point of the story. You're not supposed to go around like a fundamentalist insisting that it historically happened because the, the true insider knows that it's, it's the superficial story is not the actual meaning of the story. The story is what is it conveying? What is the message of it? Um, so when you get to like Mark talking about the empty tomb, this is all symbol. Like, and he, he actually, it's often been denied, but you can find he's got allusions from scripture that he's constructing out of. He's getting material from pagan literature too about empty tomb stories and stuff. He's actually pulling this stuff together and creating his own basically tale. It's a tall tale that he's telling. But the reason he's picking pieces, they're not arbitrary. It's not like he's just arbitrarily copying stuff. Right. He's choosing everything he chooses to assemble from other sources to assemble his story out of has a purpose. It, it has a communicative meaning that you would theoretically at the time preach from. You probably wouldn't preach to the public. You would preach in, in to congregations, to insiders, right? Um, at this time when, when Mark is publishing. So the, it would be like Jesus. He, Mark 4 has Jesus say this, like, to outsiders, I'm telling these stories. But to you guys, I'm going to take you aside. And in private, I'm going to tell you the true meaning of the stories. Don't be deceived by the outside superficial stories. You know, when I talk about a guy met a guy, I don't mean that actually happened. I mean, I'm, there's some sort of symbolic meaning here you have to get. So Mar Mark has Jesus say this outright to insiders. So that's the model for the Christian church at his time is insiders are going to get the truth. Outsiders are going to be told a sort of fictional story. And, and they're supposed to believe it as true. But that makes them the damned, right? They're the ones who are going to be distracted by this superficial historical story and be never get the truth. But the insiders are going to be given the truth. There's the symbolic meaning is the truth, right? So this is when Mark is writing. It's obvious. He tells us practically that and by having Jesus say this in chapter 4. So when he's doing the empty tomb, he, he's not really intending you to think that there was actually an empty tomb. That's not relevant. He's not quite citing sources. He's not saying, well, the women were there and told me. You know, he doesn't say that. No, it's, this is a story and the women run away, right? And so there is a use of the story in literalist context, right? Because the, the people will point out that having the women run away and never tell anyone would explain why no one's ever heard of this empty tomb before. So it has utility for selling the literal story. It's still a fake story. It's completely yeah. made up. Um, but I think the insider is supposed to get that there's this, that you're, if you think this is about an empty tomb, you're completely missing the point. Right. Uh, this, this is a symbol for the land of the dead. It's a symbol for Jesus' triumph and, and what that's death and triumph means. Because there's allusions to, um, for example, in that chapter uh, that we'd mentioned before in on the history, I'm sorry, in uh, the empty tomb mm -hmm. uh, on the spiritual body of Christ. Uh, I have the whole section on the legend of the empty tomb, and I, I show like there's definite allusions to um, Jacob's well. So basically, uh, Mark is crafting the story to make the empty tomb allude to Jacob's well, the Jacob's well story. And so an insider is supposed to catch that and then go back, or they probably wouldn't have to because they already know the story, but they could go back to the story of Jacob's well where it's about how the, basically it's an analogy to the water of life will save Israel and stuff like that. So this is Jacob's well, the empty tomb is Jacob's well. Out of the death of Jesus will be the salvation of, is, of Israel, the new Israel in their perspective. So you get all these, they're, they're symbolical purposes, right? It's not history. Once you see that, then that, now we have the, the context of, yes, this is what's done to construct mythical historical stories about non-existent people. And then here we have internal evidence. This is exactly what Mark is doing. And once you have that, there's there's just nothing left. There's nothing to argue from. Is like, well, maybe there's something historical in Mark. It's like, well, yes, maybe, but we have no evidence of that. And all the evidence is perfectly well explained by it not being the case, but mm -hmm. Mark just coming up with it. And I've mentioned before, I have a whole article on how Mark, a lot of what Mark is doing is reifying the letters of Paul. He's taking those things that Paul just teaches and says, and he's creating stories involving Jesus walking around talking to people that reify and represent the teachings of Paul. So he's using Jesus as a character, as a voice piece for Paul, uh, and as the, the mouthpiece for the gospel and the message and everything. So there's a lot of what Mark is doing in the gospel and his construction of stories, and even its arrangement, comes from Paul. He's just, you know, taking what's in Paul, which is not a narrative of Jesus, it's just teachings, and then he's turning it into a narrative about Jesus. And that's, in context, normal. That's what they always did. That's how myth was constructed all the time. So it's obvious Mark is doing this. So that since that fully explains, you can explain all the content of Mark that way. Um, there isn't anything in Mark 
that is more probably historical uh, that relates to Jesus. Like he puts historical characters in there, but there's the fact that they interacted with Jesus that you can't, there's no external corroborating evidence that that ever happened, right? right. The part about Jesus just does not. I nothing. mean, we might as well ask, did Romulus engage with historical Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly, right. Like like there really was a Rome, right? There really were kings of Rome and stuff. And um, But no, Romulus wasn't there. Uh, so um, so that, that's the point that you have to get, uh, understand in the context of this. And when you get it in context and you see that, there are passages in Mark that are 50-50 where I can say we can't prove he's mythologizing here, but we also can't prove that it's historically based. And with 50-50, you can't use that passage to argue for either theory. So it just gets chucked. You can't use it as evidence. And what's what's left, apart from those uncertain 50-50 cases, is all pro-myth. Like, it's all obviously this is a myth. There's nothing supporting it being historical. It's more probably. So the prior probability that the rest of Mark is, uh, is non-historical is... Uh, you know, high already, right? So we can show this. So yeah, it does require this. And you asked if I get frustrated over this, and I, I get frustrated when scholars don't get this because uh -huh. they ought to know better. They they should by now know all of this stuff. I was shocked and surprised that I had to have my chapters four and five and on the history of Jesus so long, because in my interactions with scholars over this, they they're it, it's not that um, they all didn't know all the things in there. Every one of them knew bunches of things in the, the those chapters but none of them knew everything in those chapters. And so I never found anyone who knew all of that stuff. So I had to put all of that stuff in there, even though it's not even really disputable. Uh, it's all firmly in evidence and even like in many cases, well supported by uh, peer reviewed scholarship already. I had to put those long chapters of the 48 elements uh, to put that in there so that people can get the context so they understand where I'm coming from. And, and if, you, if you're still operating on anachronism, you don't know that stuff you won't get the rest. But scholars should know this. They should know, how, not only should they already know all of that stuff, but uh, even if they don't, they should know that it, as a scholar, oh, I should check into that. I should read those chapters, get up to speed so that I know the right context that we're talking about. That's how scholars should behave. But they, they just won't read it. They ignore it uh, and pretend that it's not true. And then you get ridiculous, uh, we can go into examples of, in another video maybe, but uh, examples of them making declarations about the ancient world that are plainly demonstrably false, like outright false because they didn't check. They didn't even read the chapters where I actually present the primary evidence and the scholarship and stuff. So that frustrates the hell to me. That everyone else wouldn't get it doesn't frustrate me at all. I think this is an opportunity to like teach them things that they aren't being taught uh, by the experts. They aren't ta being taught by their pastors. Uh, they won't have heard of this stuff. And it's valuable for them to get a better understanding of the ancient world. And this is their opportunity to do it. So even if you don't believe in mythicism, the book on the historicity of Jesus will be super useful to you because it has all of this background information that will give you a better sense of the context of antiquity so that you will understand everything about Christian literature better, even if you're a historicist, even if you think Jesus existed. So I think, so for regular people, I'm not frustrated at all. I totally expect this. And so, I, and I hope that they will be encouraged to actually read this stuff so they can get up to speed and learn this stuff so they have a better sense of antiquity. And I don't expect them to already know that because well, how would you, right? So it's us, us, us experts should should know this already. And wow. Uh, so that's anyway. That's my re long response to your question there. Excellent. Thank you.